reliance upon God's Holy Spirit. Only God can reveal Himself. And He longs to do it. He wants so much to let us see Him. Let me share this verse, please, from Psalm 27. Actually, it's two verses. Psalm 27, 8 and 9. When thou saidest, Seek my face, my heart said to thee, Thy face, O Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face from me. Amen. He delights when we seek his face. Amen. And the way we find his face is by asking him to reveal it. Hide not thy face from me. And so we seek him, and then we ask him to reveal himself. That's how we find him. I love in this connection, Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse 9. And it talks about when the bride gives the groom one glance with his eye. In other words, look to Jesus. And when the groom sees one glance, chapter 4, verse 9 says, You have made my heart beat faster by one glance of your eye. So when we look to the Lord, we speed up God's heartbeat. He just enjoys so much when we look to Him. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to once again commit this time in prayer. But I'm also going to ask you, uh, many of you know my son Steve. And uh, Steve, while I'm here, uh, is in Mississippi. And he has a wonderful opportunity there. He'll be speaking, I think, eight times throughout this session uh, with the with saints there. Uh, but about two days ago, he came down with a very serious ear infection mm -hmm. and uh, kept him out of work. He's in a lot of pain. He's on antibiotics and all, but he begins his ministry today. And uh, I don't know God's plan. I know in weakness there is the strength of the Lord. But I just think as we pray for our gathering, uh, if we could include Steve and uh, the gathering that they're going to have. I'd like to do that. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much that you get so excited when we start to look to you, when we put our eyes on you. It's almost unbelievable to read word pictures like we can make your heart flip over or beat faster. But how we thank you for your heart toward us, that you do delight in us. And we want to be ministered unto, but more we want this time to be for you. And we pray it be a blessing to your heart. Amen. And we pray as we gather and consider your word, and as we receive, as our brother shared, the grace to appropriate it, we pray that would be a blessing to your heart. I pray in a special way for my son Steve. We thank you for giving him the message that you've given him. And we just pray for great liberty in his heart. Yes. And that he would be above all this physical. And that he would, by your spirit, communicate a full Christ Amen. to those hum hungry cancers. We thank you, Lord, that we can trust you for this. And we just ask you now to meet with us and show us Christ in a fresh, Amen. in a living way. Amen. We ask in Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, uh, I feel very blessed to be with you and uh, very blessed that uh, this text, usually when I speak, the it's been the, the plan that... Uh, Whatever God lays on your heart, share. Uh, this time a text was given to me, and even an outline. Would you share this and this and this? And uh, my heart is thrilled because this particular passage is so comprehensive and covers so much of all the truth that we enjoy. So we're going to, uh, to look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. Uh, sort of introducing this will be not in one spot, will be a little bit all over the field. Uh, 
those who have sat through our little Del Mar series on Philippians might recall some of these principles. We've had privilege to be at Sister Janet's house and we've touched on some of these truths, but uh, especially lesson two and lesson three, uh, this sort of introduces us to it, but the next two lessons are so critical. And just pray that the Lord will unveil himself. Now, in the book of Philippians, you know that Paul was, when he wrote this, he was in prison in Rome. And uh, what that tells us, it tells us several things, but it tells us it was at the end of his life. And that also tells us, as I learned at a Bible conference last week, that uh, he was in his maturity when he wrote this. Now, this isn't something that just came from someone who just came to the Lord. He had been walking with the Lord, according to the, the chronology of when this was written, he had been in Christ for more than 30 years. So he'd been knowing the things of God. He's not a novice in Christ. Very much immersed in the truth of grace and the truth of the Lord Jesus. And uh, if anyone had all the ins and outs of the principles of the new covenant, I think the Apostle Paul did. He had entered in. He's mature as a Christian. Uh, I can't prove it. I think probably at this point he was probably more mature than any Christian who's ever walked on this planet. I know he came further than I came. And my guess is probably, I don't want to judge your heart because I don't know how far you've gone. But there's a good chance that he saw things you haven't seen yet. And so we want to look at Paul's maturity as he lays out his passion. After 30 years in Christ, he said, this is my passion. Now, I remind you that though he was mature, his own testimony, and in this passage, his own testimony is, I've not yet arrived. Chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Jesus Christ. Paul had come miles, light years, in his union with Christ. But there's no bottom to knowing Jesus. There's no end. And Paul says, as far as I've come, I haven't arrived, there's more. And so his passion is in terms of that. He said, that I may know him more. I know I've known him for 30 years, but I want to know him more. And as he comes to the last chapter in his life, when he writes in his maturity, when he's at the end of his road, he says sort of, let me give you a summary of my heart at this point. Uh, <clears throat> chapter 3 and verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable to his death. I want to rehearse just a little bit of what Lex said. Uh, as you know, all of this started because uh, on Easter Sunday I had the privilege and we spoke out at the sunrise service and then had a privilege to speak here. And I focused on that first part. But I focused on only one part of the first part. When I shared on that Easter Sunday morning my point was on the power of the resurrection. And I tried, I don't expect you to remember if you were here, everything I said, but I tried to illustrate power. And my whole point was that in the New Testament, resurrection is God's picture of power. In the Old Testament, it's creation. 
And we illustrated it by his resurrection and by his ascension and his session. And someday we're going to be raised and our dust will be changed. And all of that shows power. And the point I was making is that it's impossible to take one step in the Christian life without the power of the resurrection. That's the minimum. That's not the maximum. That's the minimum. And Paul said, you're not going to get that unless God shows you. So let me read that prayer and then we'll get to our text. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at 16. He said, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. And then he makes his prayer. He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so you will know what is the hope of His calling. And then he says, and what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And then he says, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. And then he gives an illustration. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills, all, that is all in all, fills all in all. And after that message, Brother Lex called me and asked me to consider meditating and unwrapping some of this. The sentence ends in verse 11. You notice there's a semicolon at the end of 10, so let me just read verse 11. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now if you just read that, la la la, you'll think he's talking about someday I'm coming out of the grave. And he said, I want to make sure that I don't miss that. I want to come out of the grave. But it's interesting, uh, in the original, it, there's a little twist in that. Kenneth Weiss translates it this way, If by any means I might arrive at the goal, namely, an out-resurrection from among dead ones. In other words, Paul said, I have discovered a truth, and not everybody has that truth. There's a lot of Christians that are dead because they haven't entered in. And he said, I want this truth so much that I can know an out-resurrection from the dead ones, who are still living, but from among the dead ones. And so I pray this weekend that God will raise us a little bit from the dead ones. As I said, I don't think there is any passage that is more comprehensive than the one Paul is expressing. If you really understood everything God meant by that, knowing Him in the power of His resurrection, knowing Him in the fellowship of His suffering, knowing Him in such a way that you're conformed to His death, you're pretty much on the way to the millennium. <laughs> you're pretty, if you can get that in your heart, if I can get that in my heart, we've come a very long way. This is the whole counsel of God. So here's what I want to do, and may God help us, as in terms of the light I have present, I've discovered that today's light is tomorrow's darkness. <laughs> Next you get more light, you get more light. But with the light I have now, and with my understanding, I want to try to nail for you what does this mean? Each one, each message. I want to know in my heart exactly what is God saying 
when he says, know him in the power of his resurrection. What does he say? What is the fellowship of his suffering? May God help us, especially in that message. Uh, God has really opened my heart to some a wonderful truth that I want to share. And then what does it mean to be conformed to his death? So may God help us. That's Amen. where we are, and that's what we're going to look at. Now, usually I try to stick pretty much to the context. And since Philippians 3.10 is in Philippians, I would like to stay in Philippians. However, I'm going to change my method. And the reason is because that verse is bigger than Philippians. He's talking to the Philippians, but it's the passion at the end of his life, and he's saying, this is what I have discovered. It's my passion for everything. And so I'm going to take that little verse out of the immediate context and put it in the context of the whole scripture. What does God mean in the whole Bible? Amen. To know him and the power of his resurrection. Mm. I want to see it in the balance of all the scripture. And I'll do the same thing with each part. So may God help us. And I uh, hope you won't be confused because I'll be uh, going many places. I think most people have a general idea of what it means to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Except I don't think when Paul expressed his burden, his passion, his desire, I don't think he was talking generally. I don't think he's saying, I hope you get a general idea of what I mean. I think Paul had a very specific idea of what he meant. And when he said, my prayer is that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, he had something in mind. Not just a general idea. He had something very specific. And God helping us, we're going to try to find out what that is. So by God's grace, let me try to, to nail at least that first expression down. Uh, on Easter morning, I emphasized power, the power of the resurrection. But if you're going to really examine his prayer, he's not really praying for power. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And I'm not going to discard everything I said on Easter Sunday, but I do want to take your eyes off something called power and put your eyes on the Lord Jesus. And even a glance <coughs> toward him is going to get his heart beating faster. Paul's prayer was to know Christ and the power of the resurrection. Uh, the prayer is to know him in the power of the resurrection. Let me state it this way. Paul said, as I come to the end, after 30 years, with all my experience, he'd already been to the third heaven. He has experienced Christ. And he said, at the end of all of this time, at the end of my 30 years, I want to know the risen Christ in all his power. That's what he's saying. That I might know him. That I might know the risen Christ in all his power. Uh, as we look at this, I've had an expression, not everyone likes it or agrees with it, but it's I got it from Hudson Taylor. It's the best I can come up with. And that's the exchange life. In other words, his life for mine. And I think at the end, Paul was saying, I want to know him, the risen one, in my heart. I want to know him in all that his victory, all that his power as a risen one is. Now, the second experience knowing the fellowship of the suffering, is going to make no sense to you if you don't have the first one. Mm -hmm. These go together. And I'm not going to understand what it means to be conformed to his death 
if I don't know what it means to fellowship in his suffering, and I'm not going to know that if I don't understand the first one. And so pray in your heart as we go through this that this first one gets nailed because everything comes out of this. Let me quote 310 again. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. I say I'm going to hold that in the light of all scripture, and that takes us back to the beginning. So I'm going to ask you to turn, please, to the book of Genesis. If I'm going to properly understand what Paul was praying, he had discovered God's original intention. He had discovered God's purpose. And he said, I'm not at the bottom, I'm not at the end, I have not arrived, I want more. But he had discovered that. I think it would be helpful if we can go back to the beginning and say, what was God's original purpose that 4,000 years later Paul discovered? All right, Genesis chapter 1. God's purpose in creating man. God said, let us make man in our image. Oh, verse 26. Chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, don't read that la la la, that God created us in his image. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? One thing, of course, it means is that man is unique. Only man has been created in God's image. That's why in Genesis 9, we won't look there, but you can check it out in verses 3 to 6. That's why you can eat animals. You can't eat man. Because in the image of God, he created man. And uh, animals are not created in the image of God. Now that's the heart, the essence of the falseness of evolution. It's not that can an a, a animal become a man. But the question is, can something not created in the image of God ever become something that is created in the image of God? There's no possibility of that. Well, that just shows that there's a great difference, but what is the image of God? I have a wonderful library. Some of you have seen it. And I have a section on the image of God. And you would be amazed at the thousands of pages that have been written as man is trying to figure out what is the image of God. They say, well, God's a spirit, and he can think, and he can will. So the image of God is the ability to think and will. Except uh, we've had some squirrels in our <laughs> past that can think. <laughs> I think they can think, and they seem to will, and animals can will. So, and certainly angels, can they think? Can they will? Are they in the image of God? Angels were not created in the image of God. So whatever the image of God is, it's got to be a little different than able to think and will. Some say, well, you know, the Trinity, the, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three parts. And we are a body and a soul and the Spirit, we're three parts. That's the image of God. And some break it down further and say, well, you got to know the difference between the soul and the Spirit. And this is mind, emotion, will, and this is... You can be conscious of the world, and this you can be conscious of yourself, and this you can be conscious of God. And they, they take it apart, and they analyze it, and they just say, well, the ability to think logically. And they have all kinds of things. This is a moral capacity to discern good and evil. That's the image of God. The ability to choose. That's the image of God. It's conscience. 
Animals don't have a con. That's the image of God. It's the ability to laugh. Only human beings can laugh. And so that must be what the image of God is. Uh, all this self-consciousness, world consciousness, God consciousness. Some say, no, the image of God has to do with dominion, lordship. That we're in charge. We're at the top of the food chain. And we control everything. And then it says in Psalms, you know, in, in here it looks like man is lord over the, the animals and the fish and so on. But in Psalms it says that man was made lord over all the works of his fingers. And then it starts mentioning the stars as the works of his fingers. Was man originally created to be lord over the whole universe? And they say, that's the image of God. Well, as you go on in your study of the Word, ask God to help you get to the bottom line. And what I'm saying is, all of this mental exercise and gymnastics, trying to figure this out and that out, it's going to drive you crazy. It's, it's just a mental exercise. It's futile. Has God said anything that's crystal clear, bottom line? And I'm suggesting he has, not only on this, but on every issue. Get to the bottom line. Let me quote three passages from the New Testament. Some of you, maybe, I know Paul has. Some of you have been to Bible school. Most of you, I guess, have not, right? Anybody here been to seminary? All right, when we read these passages... I'm going to give you a theological question. Theologians are struggling with it, but you're going to know. Just from these three verses. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. If our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the image of God? Who is the image of God? Colossians 1.15 He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Hebrews 1.3 He is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. He upholds all things by the word of his power. All right, theologians, all you exegetes, what's the image of God? Jesus. I can't hear you. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the image of God. That's the image of God. That's the bottom line. It's Christ. And when God created man, He created him to reflect Christ. He created him in the image of God. The image of God is Christ. And that was God's original intention. That man would reflect Christ. That's man as God intended man to be. Apart from all other creation. Angelic. animal. Apart from all other creation. He said, I'm going to take man. And I'm going to put my image. He will be in my image. That's the heart. That's the bottom line. That's the essence. That's the pit. That's the marrow. That's the point. That when God looked down from heaven. A man that he had created. He would see himself. He would look at man. And he'd see Christ. And it was God's plan that man would radiate Christ all over this planet. That's the image of God. Christ in man. And when God looked down and saw man and saw Christ in man, he would be well pleased. It would bring joy to his heart. He would be satisfied. That's the original plan. Well, you know the story. Man sinned. Man fell. And when he fell, we say he fell into sin. I like to say it this way. He fell from God's original intention. He fell from what God created man to be. And when he fell, 
began to live like an animal because he was separated from that which makes man man, the image of God. It takes God to be a man. It takes God to be a woman. It takes God to be a husband. It takes God to be a wife. It takes God to be a parent. It takes God to be a child. It takes God to be a student. It takes God to be an employer, an employee. It takes God to be a friend. It takes God to be a neighbor. It takes God to be a Christian. And all of a sudden, he lost more than dominion. He lost more than 95% of his brain. He lost more than the ability to laugh at what was he should have been laughing at. All right, let's get the bottom line. What did he lose? Ephesians 2.12. I'll read the verse. You tell me what he lost. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in this world. What did he lose? Without God in this world. Ephesians 4.18 Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Separated from God. Excluded from the life of God. Man lost connection with God. He lost the very thing that makes man, man. That makes him unique. The image of God. You don't need to be a scholar to see all the damage that has been done in this world because man was separated from God. And I'm not going to go in and describe all the sorrows in the world, but for thousands of years, that's what you see. Devastation and heartache, man living without God. Devastating. Until one day, May God be blessed forever. Amen. Matthew 1, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. She shall bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God. God. Say it. God. 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 He put God back in the man. Yeah. No. Man, as God created man to be, mm. is on the earth again in the person of our Lord Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Now there's two parts of that wonderful humanity. I'll mention the first, but I'm not going to develop it because I want to get to the second. The first, of course, by his incarnation, by his perfect life. He lived a sinless life by his vicarious death, by his going into the grave and being raised from the grave. And he undid all the damage that man did when he fell. That's the first thing. He undid all that damage. Mm. But there was a second contribution of the Incarnation. He not only fixed everything that the first Adam had messed up, but he demonstrated for 33 and a half years what it would look like if man began to live like God created man to live. I want to show you that. I want you to see that because this is what Paul discovered. You'll see how it ties in as we get closer and closer to the end. But for 33 and a half years, Jesus lived as God created man to live. The image of God. You can't have the image of God without the God whose image it is. And so we have the image of God on the earth. Now, 
I want to show you how he demonstrated that life. I'm going to ask you to turn, please, to Philippians chapter 2. <coughs> Once again, the theologians get into this verse, and they're all excited because it's the greatest Christological verse or passage in the entire New Testament, and they get into all their theology, and they have steps, his steps down, and his steps up, and all countless steps. We don't need to get into that. I want to give you the bottom line. I want to give you the heart of this. Philippians chapter 2. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ. Verse 5. Thank you. Verse 5. 5 to 7. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. And it goes on to show how he gave himself, even to the death of the cross. Now, when he emptied himself, the very least that it means is that he emptied himself of the outer manifestation. He never stopped being God. He can't stop being God. He is who He is. He was always God. But He laid aside the outer manifestation. Let me give an illustration of that and come back to the point. Revelation 21, 23 talks about heaven. It says, And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp is the Lamb. Why don't you need the sun and the moon up in heaven? Because you got Jesus up there. In the lamp, the Lamb is the lamp. Jesus prayed in John 17, 5, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory I had with you before the world began. And so now he's got all the glory of deity again. He's back with the Father. And in fact, he's more glorious now than he was before because he carries with him also the acquired glory of the cross. So he's earned a, another glory. So he's actually more glorious now than he was in eternity past. But let me ask you this. When Jesus lived on the earth for 33 and a half years, <coughs> Was there a need for the sun to shine? Yes or no? When he was on earth. Yeah. We still needed the sun. And we still needed the moon. And we still needed the star. Why? Because he set aside the manifestation of his glory. He got it back. And so in heaven we won't need that anymore. But when he was on the earth, he set that aside. Philippians 2, again, verse 5. I want to show you the break it down just for the sake of analysis. He emptied himself of who he was by nature. By nature, he's God. And he took who he was by nature. He didn't stop being him. He's still him. But he set it aside. That's first thing. Second thing, he never looked back. He never looked back and tried to grasp at what he had set aside. He set aside who he was by nature, and it was forever, and he never looked back and tried to live off of what he had set aside. I'll give you the next part in another connection. Jesus lived on the earth He's the God-man, but he set aside the God part. And never once did Jesus on the earth live the God part. He never acted as God, not even once. There are occasions I think he might have been tempted to act as God, to reach back. When he was tempted in the wilderness and Satan is trying to get him to sin, Boy, if that were me, I would have pulled out my Godhead and kicked Satan. 
<laughs> he didn't do that. He never relied on his Godhead when the men of Nazareth were about to throw him off a cliff. I think I'd have drawn back on my Godhead and said, all right, you guys, you want him? He never did that. When they came to arrest him at Gethsemane, more than 800 people, he didn't rely on his Godhead then. When he was mistreated, when he was beaten, when they put a blindfold on him, spun him around the soldiers, punched him in the face and said, all right, you can see through the blindfold. Name him. Tell us who hit you. I would have pulled out my Godhead and I said, he never did. He never did. Not even once. To live as God intended man to live, he had to set aside who he was by nature. And he had to stay away from it and never go back to it ever, ever again. And for 33 and a half years, he lived in total dependence on his indwelling father. Listen, please, to his own testimony. John 5, 19. Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, these things the Son does also in like manner. The Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. The Father will show greater works than these so that you will marvel. John chapter 17, verse 7 and 8. Now they've come to know everything you've given me is from you. The words you gave me, I've given to them. They received them. They truly understood. I came forth from you. They believe that you sent me. John 10, 37. If I do not the works of my Father, do not believe me. If I do them, though you don't believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. That's how he lived. John 14, 8. Philip said, show us the Father. It's enough for us. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you, and yet you've not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative. The Father who's abiding in me, He does the works. Acts 2.22 Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. As you yourself know, not one time did he ever draw on his Godhead. He set aside who he was by nature. He never went back to that. And instead, he said, I will live on the earth in total dependence on the Father who is in me and I am in the Father. And I will demonstrate forever man as God intended man to be, one who sets aside who he is by nature and never turns back and lives instead in total dependence upon the life of God that indwells him in whom he is abiding. This is man as God intended man to be. Jesus said, I say nothing on my own. If my Father says it, I say it. If he sends me, I go. I do nothing on my own initiative. If there's a miracle to be done, my Father has to do it. I'm going to depend on him at all times. And I'm never going to go back. My stepfather is sick. I'm not going to save him. My mother's standing at the cross and the sword's going through her heart. I gotta let it happen because my father wants it to happen. You're gonna be obedient even unto death. Even unto the death of the cross. I'm not gonna save myself. 
I'm not going to defend myself. Whatever God wants, that's what I want. I hear they're about to chop off the head of my forerunner. I can stop it. I'm God. But I can't because I can't go back to that. I've said it and said it. I'm going to depend on my father. For some reason, he's going to let John get his head put on a platter. And I'm not going to stop it. I can't stop it. John chapter 6, verse 57. After he lived that life, set aside who he was by nature. Determined never to turn back to it. Live in total dependence upon his father. When he's getting ready to leave the earth. John 6, 57. As the living father sent me. And as I live by the father. So he who eats me. Will now live because of me. John 5, 15, verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears fruit. Without me, he can do nothing. <laughs> See, I can do a lot without him. Nothing with, that can be called fruit. <laughs> I can do nothing. From him. Amen. He demonstrated for us forever. He set aside who he was by nature. He determined never to go back. And instead, he said, I'm going to depend upon God. And then he looks out at his people and he says, As the Father sent me, so I send you. As I set aside who I was by nature, you're going to have to set aside who you are by nature. And as I determined never, ever, even once to depend upon what I have set aside, you're to have no confidence in the flesh ever, not even once. Mm. And as I lived because I was abiding with an indwelling God, so now I've come to live by my spirit in your heart. So God can look down again and see man and he sees Christ. He sees the image of God. He sees man as God created man to be marvelously demonstrated by the life of our Lord Jesus who is the image of God. Remember how Jesus said to his disciples in Mark 8, 34, 35, he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever loses his life, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Bottom line, we read these things and we get so think they're so deep. They're not deep. There's nothing deep. Truth is a person. And he's, God is one. And one is simple. <laughs> and anything to do with the Lord is simple. Error is complicated. And that's why Satan muddies up the truth. Tries to make it complicated so that you can't follow the truth. But the truth is always simple. Say, what does it mean to deny myself? Because if I can't deny myself, I can't be his disciple. What does it mean to take up a cross? I need to know that. Because he said I can't be his disciple. What does it mean to lose my life? Let me give you the bottom line. It's simple. It's not hard. <laughs> There's two lives. Yours and his. One must be denied. Okay, I deny me. <laughs> I take him. What does it mean to take up the cross? The cross is the place of rejection. That's ultimate rejection. There's two lives. One must be rejected. Okay? I reject me. 
I choose him. What does it mean to lose your life? There's two lives, his and mine. One's got to be lost. One's got to be saved. All right, I'll lose me. What does it mean to set aside who you are by nature? It means I deny me, I take him. I reject me, I take him. I lose me, I take him. It's his heart that just chooses him and never turns again, never grasps after that which it set aside. Even though it's possible to do that, to go after it, he said, I'll never do that. We always choose his life. Let me come back to the verse and sort of get, wrap this up, this first one. When Jesus set aside who he was by nature, it was not a process. It was an act. One time. It wasn't, he didn't grow into it. He didn't gradually set himself aside. He said, I come to do your will. I delight to do your will. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. I choose once and for all. But then you look at your life, I look at mine, and I say, well, then you know it's a process. I got to die to self. I got to live the cross and give up a little bit here and a little bit there. And I'm suggesting that it's not a process. I'm not going to rule out the process part, that's another thing, all its own, but it's an act. When do I set myself aside, who I am by nature? You've heard this a million times, let me give you the scripture on it, please. Romans 6, 5 to 7. If we become united with him in the likeness of his death, Certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old self was crucified with him. In order that the body of sin might be done away with. So we would no longer be slaves to sin. He who has died is free from sin. Romans 6 verse 10. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, alive to God in Christ. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. One of them. Colossians 3, 1 to 4. If you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. You have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, you will be revealed with Him in glory. You've heard it a thousand times. Let me just say it again. When did your old man die? When? You all know it. When Christ died, I died. You say, then how come it's not working? <laughs> how come it's not working? If I died 2,000 years ago, when Christ died on the cross, how come there's so much Ed Miller, so much flesh, so much self? When do I die practically? When do I really die? All right, here's the answer. Bottom line, I'm going to tell you, it's simple. You died 2,000 years ago in the person of Christ. When he died, you died. You say, yeah, but when do I die now? As soon as you start believing you died 2,000 years ago. Yeah. You follow what I'm saying? Yes, indeed. It's by faith. Mm -hmm. By faith. Once for all, by faith, I set aside who I am by nature because I believe I died with Christ 
2,000 years ago. Dying to self is over, done, through, finished. Yes, amen. It's complete. Amen. It happened 2,000 years ago. And if I believe that I died then, now there's something very new in my life. I've set that aside by faith. Once, forever. I'm not going back. No confidence in the flesh. I still go back because I'm stupid. But I don't need to go back. I'm not going to grasp at it. Now I got to live in union with the one as Jesus demonstrated, as he showed. Now I have to live in union with him and abide in him. And where he sends me, I go. And what he tells me, I do. And whatever he wants is what I want. And I want his pleasure. Yes. That's yes. life as God created man to be. Amen. That's what he's looking for. That's what thrills his heart. Amen. Set it aside. Now Paul, as he comes to the end, he says, Oh, that I might know him in the power of his risen life because mine is gone. Mm -hmm. That's why the next section is going to talk about his suffering, mm -hmm. not yours. Mm -hmm. <coughs> because that's been dealt with 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. You say, yeah, but what I'm going through is my suffering. No, it's not. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. Lord willing, after lunch we're next time touch on that second Amen. Amen. What is this first? What does it mean to know Christ and the power of his resurrection? It's the exchange life. It's knowing his life instead of mine. That's what it means. To know him and all of his victory, he now lives in me. He wants to live through me, but now he lives in me. That's the first part. Fellowshipping in his suffering is the next part. Mm -hmm. But you can't know that unless you know there's two lives. Mine is denied, mine is rejected, mine is lost, and it's only him. I'm going to live in total dependence upon him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for all that you've inspired these things to mean. Protect your people from anything that I may say or may, might have said that is off-center. Show us the simplicity of returning to original yes. intention. Yes. To live as you created us to live. To demonstrate to the world in which we live the 